sustainable land use. It uses nature-based solutions to clean up a polluted burn. It mitigates health inequalities. It's the last bit of high-quality, biodiverse green space in a deprived area. Progress in these issues are what the Scottish Government says it wants. But St Fittix is now under threat from vested interests. Politicians and private industry colluded to turn it into an industrial estate. The business plan asked for £53 million of taxpayers' money to pay this. Rishi Sunak gave them £27 million and the Scottish Government handed over the other £26. The Scottish Government's fine words include halting biodiversity loss, addressing health inequalities, ensuring a planning system that, I quote, contributes to an inclusive, just and sustainable well-being society. We call on the Scottish Government, and in particular the Planning Minister Tom Arthur, to turn these words into actual action on the ground and direct Aberdeen City Council to remove the park from the so-called energy transition zone. Hands off the Tory! Hands off the Tory! Hands off the Tory! Yeah, he's beautiful. Yeah, beast, isn't he? I live in Torrey, Bonnegask Wind. I was born and bred there. I don't want to come here in 10 years' time and then my kids haven't got nowhere to run, nowhere to play, no parks to go to, no, no fun to have. There's a nice little trail up there where you can take the dog or the kids. You know, the park up there, the coloured park, that's what we used to call it. The yellow pitch is where you kick a football. I don't want to have to come here in ten years time, five years time and have no park. What's going to happen? There's going to be no dogs running about. There's not going to be any ducks, no wildlife. Why would you do that? Look at the green hills. They've just got it done. I know. They've just went and put trees up. It's a nice thing for the kids to go around like on their scooters and stuff and they're just going to destroy it. Exactly. And then the moment the kids are getting fat and under, like overweight and all this stuff, so... Exactly. It's disgusting. Why would they do such a thing? Money. Aye, money. We need this place, you know what I mean? This is our home. Torrey was the centre of the white fishery. And you can see by coming up Torrey Main Street how good the houses are in these beautiful granite villas. This was a prosperous place. It was a huge fishing community. Aberdeen's wealth was born on the, the fishing money in the shipbuilding. It was a real community, a really good community. Everybody looked after one another. Everybody had gardens and everybody grew their own veg. It really was a lovely place. There was loads of work in Torrey then. When the oil arrived in Aberdeen, a lot of the older part of Torrey, you know, all the old houses, cottages that weren't particularly in great condition but were about to be refurbished were just really swept away. It's going to be a conservation area and then Shell came in and said we want this land for an oil base and the council took out compulsory purchase orders. They lost their livelihood, they lost everything. The fishing jobs had gone, you wouldn't get into work for the oil and gas because they, they were ticking people for AI. I mean the oil companies made money but I wouldn't say the people have made money. We've lost out with everything really with that. The prices have gone up, food prices, house prices, everything. People who were coming to Aberdeen for work could afford to pay much, much more for houses than local people. 
It meant there was a shortage of teachers. They had a shortage of nurses, a shortage of midwives, because people couldn't afford to live here. And then, of course, the services were poorer. As soon as Torrey had lost its industry, it became like a dumping ground for unwelcome things that nobody else wanted. Every single development that has been inflicted upon this area hasn't benefited the area one bit. It just makes it place look worse and feel worse and reduces further the pride that the community has in, in where they live. It's the pollution in Tory, we're entombed in it. We have had everything you could imagine. And the plan is to have another one, this Vattenfall site at Greg Ness. It's just been constant noise and pollution. You can smell it, but it's not as if it's anything you can actually see that's visible, you know, which is a bit sad. I mean, you don't know what you're actually breathing in, that's the trouble. I mean, you, you open your window in the morning and inside your window sells black spots everywhere. Your floors are all covered in this. I was at Betty's once. She had the window open and this horrendous smell of volatile organic carbons, petroleum fumes, came in. And she said it's a jet engine testing site. You've got Wellington Road, which is one of the most polluting roads in the whole of the country. You've got East Tullis Industrial Estate. You've got the railway line. Um, you've got an industrial dock. They decided that Torrey was the ideal spot to have two large landfill sites. We used to hear deer are running along here, oh and the council decided they were going to plant some trees, but the ground there was not suitable for trees, and they were told up. Mm. So the trees... Because it's a landfill site. site there's, only, there's only 12 <laughs> inches of soil. The made ground on top of the landfill was too shallow to support trees, but no, it was the deer. So they shot all the deer. The <laughs> owners live into it, and they shot every one of the deer out here. You've got a sewage works for the city. And the smell from the sewage treatment works, they complained for 14 years. It wasn't working. People were passing out in the street with the smell coming out of the factory. Finally, the folk managed to make an impact and they sent this bloke, Professor Jackson, to do an independent survey and he found out that seawater had been getting in all the time and there had been hydrogen sulphide evolution. Water treatment works, that's what it's called. They didn't want to call it a sewer, just like they didn't want to call the incinerator an incinerator. <laughs> it's energy from waste. The construction of the incinerator is well underway, and that's really, I think, just imbued the community with a real sense of urgency to dig their heels in on this one and make sure that we're not hit with yet another major industrial project. It's 500 yards from the primary school. The lorry loads will be going up that road to the incinerator with everybody's rubbish. We're going to be up against that as well. It's 150,000 ton per annum incinerator and it's taking waste from as far north as Inverness. 114,000 tonnes of non-recyclable waste goes into the bin at the moment per annum, so there's a huge capacity gap to operate that efficiently. Is ancient technology just set fire to stuff instead of being more proactive and targeting its source? It's just barbaric. The Scottish Government have said that they've got to up the recycling rate from 45% to 70%, so there's <laughs> going to be it. even less waste. <laughs> going to it. And then the Scottish government gave them £100,000 to investigate um, carbon capture and storage. Now, a diffuse stream coming out of a chimney. You can't do carbon capture and storage on that. The Americans have already spent billions of dollars establishing this. So it's just a piece of nonsense. They attempted to throw the local community a bone this time by saying that the heat from the incinerator is going to help heat a few hundred homes, but it's not even going to completely take over the job of heating. It's purely going to be a supplementary effect. Piping hot, but most likely poisonous air beneath our homes to try and warm them a little bit. My wife and I are just on the verge of uh, having a family and we are very set in our minds to not stay in Torrey after the child is born if at all possible because the health concerns are very real and obviously we have concerns about raising a child in that environment. If you compare the West End of Aberdeen and Torrey you're looking at something like 13 years in male life expectancy difference and well over 20 years um, in, in what we call healthy life expectancy. So you'll be living 20 years longer with chronic ill health. There's heavy particulate pollution and that can affect all parts of the body, but in particular has effects 
on the incidence of cancer, cardiovascular disease and respiratory disease. There's a lot of feeling here that people have just been dumped on with the unwanted developments that the other parts and the more affluent parts of Aberdeen wouldn't entertain. They're killing my kids. Nobody's got a right to do that. And the Scottish government should be doing something about it. This was the last straw for a lot of people because they couldn't believe it was even been entertained that this park could be taken. They managed to get it through with what we're becoming familiar with, which is secretive planning permission meetings and generally just obstructing and being very cloak and dagger about how they jump through the necessary loopholes to get something like that approved. All of it being funded and pressed ahead by Syrian Wood, whose significant purse pulls on the strings of the local authority at seemingly every turn. Ian Wood comes from a fishing family in Torrey. They had fishing boats when the oil industry arrived, so they could move in oil supply, you know, and they could move in engineering, made a huge amount of money. Last year he got interviewed for Hollywood magazine and he said that he hadn't heard of climate change until two or three years ago. In 2014, Ian Wood did the Wood Review that negotiated all the tax breaks for the oil and gas companies that insisted on maximum economic recovery, which means that we have to get every last drop of oil out of the North Sea. So he has tremendous influence because the Wood Review became the infrastructure bill of 2015. So we're legally committed to what Ian Wood said at that point. The Cameron government were handing out money to local authorities for local development. Aberdeen had got this heap of money. So Ian Wood said, I'll come in as your business partner and I'll have full voting rights. Nobody else in Britain has that on a city-region deal. So in 2016, the year after the Paris Agreement, Ian Wood went, oh... What we'll do is we'll spend the city region deal money on an oil and gas technology centre and anchor the oil and gas industry in Aberdeen. Right. This is not your forward thinking sort of bloke. So they've spent the government money. Same time the harbour board's going, ah, we'll do our bit for the oil and gas industry and we'll go into Nig Bay and we'll be able to get all these diving support vessels because we'll have a deep harbour. The South Harbour development promised 12,000 jobs. Not one person in Tory has been, in, <laughs> been employed by that Harbour Board. Not one. Because of the imposition of a major industrial development, the people had been promised that the park would be enhanced and that all the temporary construction areas would be reinstated and returned to the public. 2019, Scottish Government declared a climate emergency. So suddenly, anchoring the oil and gas industry in the northeast of Scotland doesn't look that smart. The Harbour Board made an investment that was not a wise one. They've tried to then think how do they get themselves out of that deficit and that involves moving standard harbour activity down to Nig Bay from the old harbour, gentrifying the old harbour and basically dumping the old industrial activity onto Torrey. Ian Wood came up with the wizard scheme of energy transition and see that green space next to the harbour? It's ours. <laughs> Aberdeen City Council changes planning policy so that they can pass it. What they're away to be doing is digging up the park and making it into another industrial park at the to do with the harbour. Improvements to the park, that was part of the mitigation for the South Harbour being developed. Now that's just swept aside because of this rezoning, so this constant promise breaking. If you actually ask them what is it you want to build there, they can't actually tell you. They cannot tell you what it is they're going to make there. They cannot tell you who's going to make it there. When a local authority owns land, and a local authority is a business partner with Aberdeen Harbour Board and Syrian Woods One Company, and the local authority is the planning authority, there is more than a conflict of interest. It 
not a transition, it's a robbery. And I, for the love of me, did not think that councillors had the right to put poison, so much poison, in a community that's killing them. And it's not prepared to do anything about if it's done. To change gear and say it's all about energy transition when it still looks like it's oil and gas led doesn't seem to be much of a transition to saving the planet better lives cleaner energy cheaper energy we can't live basically i mean you're hand to mouth at the best of it and then they bang on this bloody electric and gas and i mean you're barely, barely able to keep the bloody lights on you know who's getting the handouts <laughs> are they giving money to the people in tory to insulate their homes no they're giving money to Syrian woods one group they're saying, we will enhance biodiversity, provide job opportunities for a deprived area. What, by concreting over the last green space? And ironically, another part of the town, Denburn, has just been allocated for improvements for biodiversity, health, just all the things that are included in the Scottish Government policies. Yet they want to take this away from us. We've got the jewel in the crown that all communities are trying to create, and yet they want to destroy that in this area, and it's a poor area. And why would they do that? We can't just take away from people that haven't got much left to take. It's also a nature reserve that was funded hundreds of thousands of pounds by the local community to actually be developed in the first place. They raised 178,000 and the local council made it up to a quarter million. Chemicals and stuff were coming down from the Tullis Industrial Estate and stuff and it used to come through the water table and through and out into the sea. So they basically got money to like clean the area up, so anything coming off the burn was then getting washed out and cleaned as it was going through. That's what the wetlands basically for. But then the thing is, the wildlife's come back in and basically taken it over again, which is lovely. The burn itself is an important area for invertebrates, or part of the food chain. So we've really created a, quite a special place here. An award-winning biodiversity hotspot that's good for people's health, that's good for people's recreation. So it's a huge symbol of hope and it's being threatened by business as usual. Exploit, destroy and treat people like that. It's really frustrating because Everybody in the area loves this park and I mean even people from the other side of the town come over to the park to go out with their dogs, go for a walk. Covid really highlighted just how important it is. It's not just uh, an area where uh, local young people can, can go and play in a, in a nice green, open green space, not an enclosed green space like in a lot of cities. But yeah, for, for the mental and physical health of the, of the local community, it's, it's massive. The elderly have really suffered because of that. The, the, the park is the main thing for him. It really is. I mean, I can go to any park in Aberdeen, I can walk anywhere, but they can't. For a community that's very low income, like we, a lot of people in Torrey can't just travel outside of Torrey to find an, an alternative green space. I live in a flat, you know, so I mean, that is where garden. Mentally for me as well, after having cancer and stuff, because I found that was kind of the one place you could kind of go and just enjoy the area and relax and not worry about stuff, you know, when you're walking. Green space is a basic essential, you know, we, we're animals, we, we, we are part of nature. It's a fundamental thing that we need is to have access to green space. And that's why the UN recognises green poverty as a discrete type of poverty. The overwhelming international evidence is that the advantages of access to green space are especially notable and especially beneficial in areas of deprivation. If you're surrounded by industrial areas and you have a lack of access to green space, and that's a constant stress. There's noise stress, there's, there's light pollution. These things cumulatively over time, they undermine your, your well-being. The fact that this circumvents local democracy and people have absolutely no say in this whatsoever, we know really importantly that that in itself undermines health. This used to be a beautiful bay. So the idea is to slowly industrialise all this area completely and the old harbour will be uh, luxury flats. The park is just straight ahead. 
Um, you used to be able to drive right round and walk right round, but we haven't been able to do that for some years. And again, that's supposed to be reopened to the public, but we don't know. Because basically you are in the new harbour if you go along that road, so I don't know how that's going to manage security-wise. I think what happens in Torrey will almost be a blueprint for what happens elsewhere in Scotland for the, the transition. And they have to get it right. We have to change. We have to say biodiversity matters, people's health matters, people's security for somewhere to live, people's security from outrageous energy bills, food security. These are the things that matter. Not some billionaire making another couple of million off the backs of a working class community that's already had a good kick. <laughs> I know, I did it quite. It was just amazing. What a revelation. Hands off of story! Hands off of story! Hands off of story! They were so supportive, so great ideas, and wanting to find out everything, and it was just an eye opener. They're so well organised. They lifted our spirits some. Good on them. The climate camper said to us, we're going to occupy the marine base. Right! <laughs> I think it's, it's great that Climate Camp came to Aberdeen this year and it's also great that it's camped out in St Fittix Park. We need energy transition, but it needs to be a just transition. And doing this to the community of Torrey is not justice. As a politician, as a parliamentarian, I think it's important that I have one foot in the Scottish Parliament, but one foot firmly rooted in the communities on the streets with them. And that's why I'm here today. The very same energy companies who caused the climate crisis are being entrusted to get us out of it. Communities of workers are being sold short in this corporate-led energy transition. While the Scottish Government promised a £500 million just transition fund for the northeast of Scotland, an opportunity to redesign our energy system with environmental and social justice at its heart has been captured by the oil and gas industry. We know that net zero is not real zero. Expensive techno fixes such as hydrogen and carbon capture are diverting resources away from the real solutions such as publicly owned renewables, free public transport and mass insulation programme, empowering communities and workers so that they have a real stake in the energy transition and in decisions that affect them. The people in the community have already said they will protect the park with their bodies. And if it comes to it, we hope to see many of you here there too, as well. Imagine the community wealth that could be created if we didn't need to put our energy into preventing something like this. This is a land grab and not a just transition. Thank you. Yeah. Whose pack? Whose land? Whose pack? Whose land? Whose pack?